Thanks. Um, so this talk is entitled, What's Inside the Input Stack? And I'll be talking about something that nobody cares, usually, <laughs> basically. Uh, so I'm Benjamin Tiswa. Uh, you can find me on IC, uh, and I'm Bentis, on Freenode, on Gipnet. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I started working on the input stack in the kernel level uh, by being the feed multi-touch maintainer, the touch screen things with tender touchpad, touchpad too. And I've been designated the heat core co-maintainer and designated re reviewer recently. Uh, also, I happen to give bad advice for the upper input stack. Uh, so sometimes it's my fault if it doesn't work. Uh, one particular thing about this talk is that I will be talking a lot about we, and by we I mean Peter Arthur and myself. Uh, he's also a software engineer at uh, Red Hat. Uh, he's the lib input maintainer. We'll talk about that later. He's still the legacy uh, XORG input stock maintainer, EVDEV, Synaptic, Drivers, whatsoever. So we is me and I, in him and my. So the question you might be walking, you might be asking is why this talk isn't it working already? And yeah, if you have this type of keyboards, yeah, it's working. Uh, it's been working for the past 25 years, I guess, and it should be working for the next 25 years, unless we break it. But we'll see. The problem is. Uh, we are like chasing after the hardware makers and they can be really creative. So for instance, not sure if you, anybody have ever seen this one. Just for the safety calls, I, I brought one with me. <laughs> so it's actually there, it can change colors depending on the profile and it, yeah, it's terrible. Um, but you can say also that you will never buy such a mouse except me. Uh, problem is, yeah, problem is sometimes, I don't know if you have seen this series of laptops in 2014, yeah, uh, this series of laptops was terrible. Um, few issues, I would say, for the list. Uh, the first you can see is that there is no top row uh, for the uh, function keys. They replace that with some sensitive touch strip. As you can see, it works on .tty. <laughs> uh, because of that, they had to replace the escape key to put it on, on, in place of the tilde, yeah, just next to the one key. And the tilde is down to the uh, between the left, the right control and Alt. Uh, if you go to the Top right corner of the screen, the, this sheet, of the, uh, you would see that it's the backspace key has been split in two for backspace and delete. Just in case you want to, yeah, you messed up the, the, the basket key and you just delete it instead of using backscapes. And the final thing that has, yeah, that is terrible is the caps lock key has just disappeared and they put inside the uh, home and head. <laughs> yeah, but not on this one. <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah. Yes, yes, I will talk about that later. <laughs> uh, one thing, well, the, the thing is that this key layout is terrible, uh, but there hasn't been much of work uh, that needed to be done in the kernel. However, on the touchpad side, this is terrible too, because I don't know if many of you are using the track sticks, the little nipple in the middle, the red one. Um, they used to have some buttons uh, associated with the track stick. And with this generation of touchpad, they said, oh yes, we will have a bigger touchpad. And so we'll emulate the buttons in software. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> One thing also that we have to chase um, at the kernel level or at the uh, upper stack level is that the usage is changing. And for instance, I just grabbed this picture from the Lenovo website. It should be the Yoga Pro 3 or whatever. Uh, no keyboard, just a touch screen, maybe a pen, I don't know. And it even have a video projector on it. So yeah, things are evolving and we have to chase that. 
So this was the introduction of my talk. Um, then I'll be going into a little bit about the input architecture, um, very roughly down from the kernel up to the application. And then I'll be talking about a bunch of devices, so this particular device that I talked about. And um, last, uh, because we, all of has, we always have to talk about security, uh, there's more topics about that. So, yeah, th this talk could have been entitled Everything You Never Wanted to Know About How Input Works. We are just a few to know about it, but yeah, it's enough. <laughs> We've got um, five components, the kernel, uh, kernel recipes, uh, libinput is upper, is on the stack. Then you've got what we call Wayland. Uh, Wayland is just a protocol, so it's not entirely uh, Wayland. Uh, or Xorg. Then you got the toolkit and then you got the application. So the kernel. Um, the kernel knows about the protocols, it knows about the transport layer, and all it has to do is talking EVDEV to the user space. So basically what it does is it just translates all of the Low level event coming in from the from the touchpad on the keyboard and everything, and it just forward them into EVDEV. So that's simple enough. That means that we have a quite framed um, protocol, output protocol. It's easy to work with that. Problem is we have to deal with hardware makers, and they can be really creative in the way they instantiate things together. Then you've got libinput. Libinput is a relatively new project. It's been out for like something like three or four years. Um, it was created because the first postulate on Wayland was, well, input is easy. They can just, people can just open the EVDEV nodes and then they will just process the input. So actually, since this project started, um, Peter Hutter, the guy I mentioned, um, has been working on this for full time for three years. So as you can see, it's easy. <laughs> uh, we, this lib input also relies on libevdev that has been writ written by the same guy because evdev is easy, of course. <laughs> uh, there are few subtleties in the protocol that makes that, yeah, you need to know a lot about the inside of the kernel to be able to understand all of the uh, sequence of the events and everything. The good thing about Lib Input, it does fancy things like gestures. Uh, you can do swipes, you can do uh, pinch, zoom. And most of all, compared to the previous decades of uh, yeah, software usage that we had, it has a global view of the input devices, meaning that we can actually have disabled wiretapping done directly by the Xorg server now. Before you had to run a daemon called sin daemon to be to be able to do disable while tapping, so that's that's an improvement. Then you've got the compositor, what I call Wayland. Uh, doesn't do much at the input level. Uh, it loses lib input, meaning that lib input is a part of the compositor process. It just take the event, process them, do those that it needs to take care of, and pass the event into the right client. So that's much of interest. Then you forward this event to the toolkits. The toolkits relies on everything that we've seen before, and they also do fancy things like gestures. You may wonder why. If not, I'm gonna tell you again. <laughs> the, the reason is that if you're using touch screens, you can't assume that people are doing like a zoom because they're using two fingers. You need to know what's the actual application which is down below. So that's, that means that the toolkit knows if it can do gestures or not, while lib input that is way above in the stack can't know that. So that's why we have two gestures engine in Linux. And then you've got the application that is supposed to do something useful. It might be working. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so, yeah. Hopefully. Um, so now I was, 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about the various de input devices and tell you a little bit uh, of the stories that we had in the past. Um, first, let's talk a little bit about keyboards. I mentioned that keyboards are okay. It's actually true. Um, most are using PS2. It's a well-known protocol. No need to um, enhance this because well, you still have 10 figures to type normally. Um, so it's working. Actually, no. <laughs> so there is a, um, we have a bug in internally open. Um, it's an upstream bug too. Uh, if you switch under Linux into a TTY and try to use the caps lock key, um, the LED doesn't work anymore. So you need to actually add a new UDEV rule. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm changing the trigger of the LED. So it has been partially fixed. Okay, let's be clear. Uh, but the reason is that the um, caps lock key is in, the, in a particular way in the Linux kernel, and it, all it does is a shift in the key map. It works well for the QWERTY key map. It doesn't work well for the others. Meaning that if you want to load a French key map or whatever, a Hungarian one, or I don't know, uh, you can't use caps lock directly in the kernel because you won't get access to the full key map because it just doesn't work. So what the people uh, in set local project and everything do is that they are using left control lock because who has a left control lock on our keyboard? But that means that the trigger for the caps lock LED is triggered by the left control lock and you have to fix that by yourself in your system. Sorry? Caps lock should be? <laughs> yeah, there's one user there. <laughs> I mean, we do, we do have customers who care. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we don't have choice, we have to fix that. Mice. This one. Uh, for the kernel, not much to add. Uh, most of the time you plug a mouse, it works. Except there is one thing, so it's not the kernel, but it's called LibWatBag. And LibWatBag is the project that we started to actually control this. Uh, it used to be just a library, now it's more like a thing because it has a debug daemon and whatnot. Uh, we even have a UI, which is called Piper. Um, it's a really fun project to hack on. I mean, yeah, we're a bunch of cool guys working on it. That's very nice. Uh, the good thing is that if anybody is interested in doing reverse engineering and is afraid of breaking the kernel, this is the ideal project because at worst you will break your mouse. If it's a 200 mouse, 200 dollar mouse then. Uh, <laughs> too bad, but, but I mean, you won't get to the pain of breaking the kernel, having to reboot, uh, losing your file system and everything. And we support a lot of uh, gaming device right now, uh, Logitech, Rocket, uh, G-Skill has been added also, and we are in the progress of adding Razer. Touchpad. <coughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so the question is, why do gaming mouse have a different con need a different configuration than a regular mouse? Uh, the reason is that this type of mouse have an embedded CPU, I would say, inside, and you can actually store the configuration of the mouse inside. So, for instance, you have 12 buttons under the sum of, the, of this one, and you can assign a key sequence to each of the buttons. And what you do is you assign the key sequence to any buttons, and then you unplug the mouse and you connect it to another computer, and you still have stored the same key sequence, and you can reuse it. This is a pretty bad example. Uh, we do have some more that are like more usable, 
what I found just this one nice and <coughs> interesting. No, it's not just gaming mouse. Uh, you can have like some professional mouse from Logitech. You can actually change the DPI. You can actually change some of the settings inside. Of it. So, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, was I? So the question is, UTF-8 support, is it handled by the kernel or not? And is it, uh, yeah, that's a question, right? So the fact that we were using UTF-8 is, the fact that it broke the TTR layer is more like a conjunction of things. Uh, that's because we are starting to use different key maps in user space that we load in the kernel. And then that means that uh, the kernel gets lost with the caps lock. In. And because before we start using UTF-8 in the kernel, nobody cared about the caps lock LED, I guess, on all the caps lock key map, it was working OK. So that's more like a conjecture of events. OK? All right, touch pads. Yes? Le OK. <laughs> touch pads. Um, yeah, so behind these slides is most are still using PS2. PS2 is a crappy protocol. It's still working, but it's a crappy protocol, believe me. Uh, initially, PS2 was a three bytes protocol for mouse. Three bytes. How do you put 10 fingers in three bytes? That's a good question. Uh, Synaptics and other extended the protocol up to six bytes, so they can report two fingers. Yes. And they also have a flag that says, well, actually, I'm going to give you two fingers, but there are three on the, on the touchpad, or there are four, there are five. Yep. Thanks. It <laughs> uh, doesn't work well. Um, it kind of works by accident in the previous decades. Um, doesn't work well with libinput, because we try to uh, start from a new page, and yeah. The thing is, they are still using PS2, but uh, under Windows, they are not using PS2. They are using another bus most of the time. It's I2C or I2C. I don't know if you are priest here. I just need to swap. So basically, uh, it's trapping in SMM and emulating with the BIOS. It's emulating the PS2 in the BIOS, doing SMM trapped on the IOS. No, it's at the, the, the device level. The hardware does both? Yes. OK. The hardware, I mean, for the Synaptic device that I'm going to talk about, uh, you've got two connections, one on the PS2 and one on the I2C. And what happens is that the internal protocol is the I2C uh, RMI4 internal protocol and everything, and then they have a chip on the touchpad itself that converts this into the crappy PS2 thing. Yes. And how do you manage to figure out in the library that those two input devices are actually the same? Uh, you can do that at the kernel level. Okay. For this particular device, you can do it because, of course, you have to enumerate the I2C device from the PS2. OK. That's terrible. Uh, some other hardware <coughs> maker are using uh, what we call heat over I2C, and at this time the device is enumerated at the UEFI level, meaning that we have no idea that this PS2 device is the same as this I2C device. So we just got the information that we have two devices, one of them is mute, and one's an, ev an event. So that's, yeah, that's just bad. 
So I said that I was going to come back to this one later. It's, now it's the time. So this touchpad. Um, under Windows, they were using SMBus, which is an upper layer on top of I2C. And what happens is that the SMBus interface was fine. But it was not working on Linux, of course, because the Synaptics engineer, I mean, they do care about Linux. It would be a lie to say that. Not to say that, but um, they do not have the resource to actually work fully upstream and get everything done at the right time. So it was working by chance on the PS2 and the Linux. And the thing is, when you want to have software buttons to assign the, the, two, the three top buttons to the track stick, you need to have accurate coordinates on the touchpad. And of course, they made all of the QA. I mean, that's my interpretation. Uh, that's not actual from Synaptics, but what I get is that they made all the QA on the Windows, on the SMBus, on the dead driver. And on the PS2, uh, the actual coordinates were offset by a lot. So when we first implemented the thing, um, basically, you would declare, like you say, OK, so the first 5%, the top 5% will be buttons. And you got like something like half of your touchpad, which are the buttons. And you have just a few touchpad port. So that was a pain. So what we ended up doing, and we had no choice, because we didn't have the SMBus working properly at the time, 2014, is that we decided to quirk each and every device and say, OK, depending on the um, machine, the DMI matching, and everything, this device actually report this. Thank you, Synaptics. Six months later, I don't know if you're aware of the OEM cycles, but usually in the same type of line, they usually refresh the hardware um, just because like they ordered, I don't know, 10,000 uh, components from their manufacturer, and then they have to restart a new production. So in the T440 refresh, what happened is that they changed the touchpad, and they asked Synaptics to fix the bug. They happily did it. Problem is, now we were quirking the correctly uh, reported value. <laughs> and of course, it would have been too simple for them to reuse the exact same values that we were actually quirking. They were using different one, meaning that we have to do the job twice to actually say, OK, you don't need to quirk this one. So if you look at the code in the Synaptics driver, that's terrible because at some point you have a table which says, OK, this driver, this laptop with this touchpad, with this firmware, has these values. <laughs> anyway, a um, little bit about SMBus. Uh, we finally get it in the working upstream kernel in the 4.12. So if you are happy on of, of a T440 in the 4.12 kernel, it should be working. Except that now, at least in Fedora 26, not in Fedora 25, um, the Intel driver, the output driver, shares an operation region with the SMBus controller. And when we see that at the controller level, we say, hey, somebody else is using our operation region. I shut down myself. So yeah. Three years of work to get this working, and now uh, it's killed because the operation region manager um, makes things just work. So I deeply apologize if you're running a 412 or 413 kernel and the touchpad is broken. That's because the Intel guys. T450, the year after. They fix it. As you can see, so this is actually a T470 picture, just for the completeness, but um, it's the exact same that I have here. Uh, on the X1 carbon, they fixed the key mapping. You don't have the sensitive, the touch, what you call, sensitive touch strip, or whatever it was called. Uh, and you actually have buttons. Yes. The coordinates are reported properly, except that the buttons are reported through the touchpad. 
My assumption for that is because it's really expensive to design a case, uh, I mean a laptop case, and what they say is that, okay, Synaptics, you screwed up, uh, please fix that and provide us a touchpad with buttons. Again, it's only me assuming that. It's not uh, the actual truth. It should be close enough. And Synaptics happily did it. They added some buttons. Problem is they couldn't wire the button to the track stick because that would probably require to change the case or to change the layout of the laptop. And so they report the button to the, through the touchpad. So it works fine under Windows. Except that under Linux, what happened is that few, yeah, maybe 10 years ago, Synaptics provided some um, touchpad with button four and five, and they were like scroll up, scroll down buttons. So as you can imagine, when we first got the laptops, we got them, we hit on the button, and then the page scrolled down. Okay. So yeah, we had to fix that. Uh, it was interesting enough that we fixed that directly in the kernel. Um, we just redirected the buttons to the actual track stick device, and now it's working. And the good thing is that thanks to the requirements from uh, Lenovo of changing only the touchpad, some of the T440 users actually change, just swapped the touchpad and bought this one on eBay and it was just working. That was magic. Okay, so this is the last part of my talk, a little bit about security. Uh, when we talk about security, we talk about CVEs. Um, do we have them? The answer is yes, but only a few, as you can guess, unless you are going to tinker with the keyboard laptop. It's yeah, not very efficient. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, sorry Google guys, <laughs> it was for you. Uh, the Chromebook team uh, told us that they allow web application to actually inject heat event inside the kernel. And so that means that you would go on your browser and the browser will just pop up a page that creates a heat device on your laptop and use a buffer overflow to actually gain root access. That was nice. Uh, this has been fixed, so don't try to do it at home. It doesn't work. <laughs> I don't, yeah. yeah, it doesn't work. Um, yeah, you can you can also have keyloggers in the device and everything. So, uh, I mean, at some points, if the in the in the input world, I mean, if you have physical access to the device, then yeah, the CVEs in the input stack doesn't matter much. I mean, you can yeah, you can buy crappy hardware from China and it will just yes. Um, so the question is whether or not it's possible to intercept the flow of the USB configuration and change it so that we can actually change the configuration of the device in a bad way. Or even exploit to the... Or exploit to the, yeah. There's not much that you can do at this level. I mean, as soon as people have access to the USB stack, they can do, I mean, yeah, if, if they can listen to the USB events, probably they already would. So, but I don't know, I mean, maybe other, many, maybe other experts can tell you a little bit more, but, but I mean, yeah, most of the time, except for this Chrome OS injection uh, remotely, we are safe because we actually need to plug in device, except for mouse jack. Mouse jack. Uh, 
<laughs> so most uh, it's an interesting um, security issue that happens two years ago. Um, one year, no, two years ago, I think. Uh, some research team realized that it was possible to actually hack wirelessly uh, your um, wireless uh, mouse and keyboards. The reason is because we firmware engineers do not care that much about security, or at least they do not think of everything, of course. And uh, what happens, so it's, accumulation, it's an accumulation of two bugs um, in, the, in the wireless protocol. The first one is that they are using encryption for keyboards so that nobody else can actually um, spoof on the, on the wireless C and, and get, the, uh, get the keys that you type. So yeah, if you're using a regular keyboard and the, uh, the communication, there is a secret key and everything. It depends on the hardware maker. But I mean, it's safe as long as you use it normally. The problem is on this device. To be able to inject key events, this device actually acts like both a mouse and a keyboard. For poor consumption, you wouldn't activate the encryption of the thinking if it's a wireless one. You wouldn't activate the encryption because like yeah, control C, control V, nobody cares about that. So that means that if you manage to pair, if the attacker, if the attacker managed to pair um, mouse to the receiver and export also a keyboard, the receiver will happily accept any key events that you will send over it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that there was a hole in the protocol of the, pair, of the pairing protocol of the receivers. So on this receiver, what you can do is you can actually connect more than one device to the receiver so that you can only use one USB port and uh, have like up to six devices and for the Logitech ones. Problem is you will normally have to <coughs> enable the pairing process to the receiver and say, okay, well, I'm gonna start the pairing process and the receiver say, okay, I'm gonna listen to everything. The problem is that the, the first part of the sequence of the pairing process was actually initiated by the receiver. But if any device around was sending the second part, which is basically, hey, I'm here, I want to connect. The receiver would say, hey, come in. <laughs> And as you can imagine, uh, it's particularly easy to hack into that and connect a wireless mouse to another keyboard. You can just, um, so the receivers are like these small ones. Uh, you can even flash some of the Logitech devices <laughs> into using the, the hacking process and you can actually spoof connection and everything. It's just a product from Logitech, so it was nice. Anyway, end of the story. Uh, this shouldn't work anymore uh, if you're running an up-to-date distribution uh, because uh, for Logitech devices, at least what we did, uh, Richard Yudzi, uh, maintainer of the LVFS project, now managed to get the um, Logitech involved in updating the receivers and the mouse directly from Linux. So now you just have to run GNOME software. It shows up that there is an update for your receiver. You just click yes, it downloads it, install it, and you're safe on one check. Anyway, um, so this is nearly the end of my talk. Um, I told a little bit about the input architecture, how it works. Uh, try to explain to you that some device still needs some care and why we are still working on that. I mean, it's an endless process because hardware makers tend to be really creative and uh, sometimes security is involved and that's kind of fun, part of it. Some credits and uh, thanks. Any questions? Yes. 
so I'm going to come back to the part on the T440 and T450. So I have a T440S at home and a T470S here, so I, mm -hmm. I, um, I have to play with the bus generations. And I'm a user of the track point. And if I understood what you said, you said that in the T440 and next generation, the new um, physical buttons are linked to the touchpad. Yes, at the, at the hardware level. Yes. And, but for the T440, if I understood, the logical buttons were also linked to the touchpad and not the track point. Actually, given that LibInput has an overview of all of the input devices, it can redirect the software buttons to the track stick. Okay. So that, uh, I mean, from the user space point of view, uh, in each of these generations, the track the track seat buttons, whether they are software or the hardware, are all linked to the to the actual track seat device. Okay, because I, I've not tested recently on the T440, but for the T470S, scrolling with the track points worked out of the box. So that means that, yes, I think the, the redirect is working correctly. Mm -hmm. But the T440, for a long time, was absolutely impossible to scroll with the track points. And the reason I, I understood was that the um, the buttons were not linked to the track points, so it was not possible to have the, um, the both information that track point was in use and the scroll button was pressed. And to have to being able to make it work, uh, some guy make a dirty trick in merging the eDev and synaptic drivers in a launch pad somewhere, mm -hmm. and that make it work. Uh, but it's kind of um, a dirty thing. What? Uh, I don't understand what the difference between the, the two and why it don't work for the 40 generation. The, the two, so the T450 and the T460 generation should be using the same code pass okay. in the Linux kernel. Right? Depending on your distribution, they might not. If they did not update the patches to make it work, then yes, it's not. But it's very unlikely that it's not. So you might have some misconfiguration in the lib, lib input stack or not new enough lib input. Because like, I mean, we are, um, we are both uh, developers and users, Peter and, and, and I, but we don't know all about the, all of the usages of the touchpads. And I know that the wheel emulation came way later uh, in lib input. So probably what happened is that you had your distribution installed, unless you upgrade it. But I'm pretty sure that if, if you put the same software stack in both laptops, they should behave the same. Okay. There is one there and one there after. Um, oh, one there on there. How do you test new devices? Do you get some by manufacturer or something? Uh, from time to time, yes. Uh, otherwise, it's more like mm, <laughs> some kind of like um, voodoo or uh, just throwing a, throwing a ball. They, they have, I mean, we have uh, one good thing is that if you have a heat device, if it's an HID one, uh, what we can do is, given that it's a transport, it's a protocol which is transport agnostic, we can actually replay the event and inject the event to the heat devices. I know that there is uh, some USB equivalent for it. The problem with the USB one is that we would need to emulate most of the hardware features. So it gets kind of difficult. While with heat, um, the heat protocol is basically just, there is a descriptor which says, okay, these are the events that I'm gonna send you and then you just send the events. So what we can do is we can ask people to actually record the events, send them back to us, we can replay the devices, and we can fix the devices on our on laptop, and then we just send back the patches and everything. So, yeah, but for us, like for the T450, these kind of things, we do have some contact with manufacturer, and they sometimes send us early uh, production laptops, and we might or might not see the bugs. That's a problem like the T440, just uh, to amend myself and to apologize for the whole community. I think I had one in my desk on December 2013, 
and when it was out in March 2014, everybody starts screaming and everything, and I said, oh crap, I haven't seen that. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I have a question regarding the Chromebook issue you had. Did, did they have a specific modification uh, that wasn't in Linux, or how was it uh, Chrome OS specific? Um, so as I mentioned, you can, re you can inject event at the heat level, uh, thanks to a module which is called uheed, uh, which is in the kernel. It has been initially, initially done for Bluezy, so that the Bluetooth device actually are handled in the user space. They inject events through, uh, through the kernel thanks to this module. So what happened is that they were reusing this protocol to uh, create new device and everything. But it was still an issue in, in the kernel, in the UHEAT? Uh, yeah, we had, we had issues in the kernel. We definitely had issues in the kernel. That's why we had CVEs and we had to fix them. Um, but the, 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 the reason I found it interesting because the usage they were using, we never thought about that. We never thought that anybody would be able to actually use the web browser to create an input device. It's like, why would you do that? There was a question there. Nice for. I, I have two, re two uh, interrelated questions. Okay. So the first one is directly related to that one. Um, in general usage, it's a very naive question because I'm not familiar with that part of the architecture. So in general usage, when I'm moving my mouse, how much is happening in user space and how much is happening in the kernel? Or uh, keyboard or whatever, any input? Yeah, depends on the device you're using. I mean, if it's a mouse, um, the heat protocol is pretty straightforward, and we won't do a lot of processing in the user space, in the kernel space, sorry. So we basically just get the events forward them and forget about it. Sorry. We basically just get the event from the USB and forward that to the uh, upper stack. Uh, then most of the work is done yeah, same goes for lib input because mouse are just pretty well defined. They only have two buttons. <laughs> two buttons. <laughs> uh, you don't. You don't need to do a lot on mice. Uh, if you happen to have a touchpad, that's a different story. If you happen to have a touch screen, that's an entirely different story too. Okay. So it's difficult to. What I can say is that, yeah, definitely there is some latency. Um, some hardware makers are, are trying to make this latency go away by having some very interesting features. One thing I should have mentioned is that in the Surface Pro 4, if you intend to run it on a Linux, it doesn't work on the touchscreen because they don't have any controller uh, embedded to the touchscreen. Every, all the processing of the heat map of the touches is done by the GPU. <laughs> so you need to load uh, an OpenCV module to process the touch. <laughs> Meaning that, yeah, if you have a bug in your graphic card, you don't get input or vice versa. So that's nice. <laughs> the second question. Nice one. <laughs> um, related question. So you were talking about latency, and that's exactly what I, where I was heading. Um, so as a developer of user level applications, uh, I've, I've been faced indirectly with one problem with, with Logitech mice. Mm -hmm that tend to spam uh, with 1,000 or 10,000, I don't remember, updates per second. Yeah. Uh, uh, at least in ones. some cases, I don't remember the details. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering um, where in the, in the entire stack does this happen? It, or is it configured? Uh, or is it, is it throttled anywhere? Uh, it's a purely curiosity question. I don't have any. Yeah, we, we don't attendant. throttle anything uh, at the kernel level, nor at libinput. We just get the event, we forward them to you. So in theory, a poorly designed input device could DOS the, the kernel yeah. by spamming it, okay. To the extent of problems having USB ports for example. Yeah. It's with one of the devices that can sense for that. Okay. Yeah, so, so basically that's one of the inter interesting part of the Libra back project also is that you can actually throttle down your mouse and tell the mouse not to uh, spew at uh, one, milli every one, one report every one millisecond, but one every eight milliseconds. So, okay. yeah, but we, we don't, 
we actually can't do any filtering at the kernel level. We can do a little bit at the lib input level, um, but we can't because if you do some, you might get, you might lose some of the smoothness of the touchpad and everything. So it's it's a trade-off to do, and that's something that we will not do. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Nice. Hi. Uh, three years ago, more or less, we had a panel PC with a big touch screen. Yeah. And but the touch screen was all the panel PC was not a screen. It was only the center, and around we had some buttons, but they were mapped in the in the touch uh, panel. At that time, what uh, the way we supported it was by making a daemon mm -hmm. that uh, was reading and blocking the input device, uh, the touch panel was supported by multi-HD, uh, so that was, that was great. So we were reading the data, interpreting the data, and then sending it back through uh, UDEP, uh, emulating two, two devices, a keyboard and a mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, that's still the best way to do it today, or now we have better tools? It, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, one story I can tell you is that uh, some of the ARM boards have capacitive touchscreen, capacitive buttons attached to the touchscreens. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pragmatic approach that we have both in libinput and in the kernel is to look, to have a look at the device. If the device have like, the, the we know that the first 5% of the device are capacitive buttons and it's not used by anything else but these capacity buttons, and there is like a drawing on it, and the user expects this part of the touchscreen to be like the back button or the home button, then we will fix that in the kernel. Okay. But if it's not, like if it's a touch strip uh, sensitive thingy with an OLED display, the like the, 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 the sensitive bar that, you, that we've seen in the T4, mm -hmm. the X1 carbon, um, it's basically we can't do anything in the kernel because we don't know the usage of this thing. So it's up to the user space to deal with that. So your solution is good if uh, the device works that way. Thank you. I thought there was a question over there. Ah, you have to throw it. <laughs> I can do that for you. This morning, we were talking about uh, automatic uh, testing and validation, and I think you are working in one of these uh, probably unique areas where you cannot run a test without your fingers and uh, physical access to the device. Um, does it, do you feel like it's slowing down your development or possibly causing more regressions than what it can cause in other areas, maybe? So the, the, the answer to that is we do have regression tests. <laughs> The reason is, uh, like I said, we can emulate device. So in lib input, it has a dev suite that runs in something like 20 minutes, uh, maybe less now, uh, which given that it's only user space, we can emulate kernel devices. And we know of every small cases that we've seen in the past, and so we can fix things. And this has been a tremendous help. And definitely, yeah, if you need to, if you decide whether or not using test suits, you definitely should. And even in Libward Bag, we are actually testing, uh, we can't actually test the device right now because, yeah, we would need to plug the device and plug the device and uh, these kind of things. But this is something that we, had in, we have in mind, that we are actually testing all the protocols and the tools. And this is just, yeah, this is just tremendous. And you, you have to use CI if you don't. <laughs> Um, do you think we are already at the state where we can say one Libby input to rule them all, or there are still some drivers that are needed uh, that Libby input cannot handle for devices? Uh, one thing that Libby input doesn't handle is joysticks and gamepads. Uh, because we don't care that much. <laughs> The, the ones who care are already talking directly over EV dev. Um, so it's not handled in living input. But if you look at all of the legacy drivers that you have in the Xorg stack, um, even the Wacom one, 
is going to be deprecated a little bit. Uh, EVDEV is just as a fallback, but you really don't want to use it. Uh, the rest are like, yeah, we are in a good shape now. Yeah. Maybe you can try to do a, a bounce in the middle of the, of the room. And boom. <laughs> <laughs> That's a way to wake up the audience. <laughs> Good job. It's okay. <laughs> oh, okay, so you mentioned that uh, you didn't really care about joysticks and gamepads, but uh, I guess team people actually care. Yeah. Um, do, and I, I guess they have a lot of uh, test, uh, testers, uh, willingly or not, and especially also in the uh, other input layers and devices like keyboards and gaming mouse and do you have help from them? Uh, for the gaming mouse, yes. We do have a few contributors uh, for the gaming mouse that were involved. They were using different projects and they were kind of trying to to gather them in a little while back. Um, for the rest, I mean for the the, the input the joysticks and the touch and the game pads, uh, we, I mean, when I say we don't care, it's we personally, uh, Peter and I, it's not the Linux community. Uh, there are things that need to be done at the Wayland protocol level uh, to be able to forward to the SDL, for instance, the, um, the game, the, the, the FD corresponding to the, to the game pad. Um, but they tend to, from what I can see, is that they tend to say, okay, well, just just give us the thing and we'll deal with it. Okay. So it's kind of like a yeah, passive approach. So, yeah. so anyway, I don't think we have time for another question. And it's time for coffee. It's coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah I finished. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Okay.